This video might be long, it might be shorter than I expected it. Either way, roll the intro. I'm thinking about coffee. All I'm saying is that if I look this tired, this video better be somewhat good. Hello everyone, I am the Religious Hippie. Welcome back to my channel. If you have not heard of me, why? Just kidding. Welcome, I am happy you're here. And if you are returning, I'm so happy that you are here, still. Thank you for your support. I truly appreciate each and every one of you. You guys are amazing. If you want to follow me on my other social media platforms, they're going to be linked below in the description, but I'm basically on every social media platform. Just type in the religious hippie and you will find me. Okay, so today we're going to talk about baptism, specifically what the Catholic Church teaches. Now I'm just going to jump straight into it. So baptism is one of the first sacraments that Christians get. Um, specifically, you know, Orthodox, Catholic, Lutheran, um, they all understand the importance of baptism. And with all sacraments, it comes with three elements. It comes with the matter, which is water. It comes with the form, which is saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus tells us that in Matthew 28, 19. And the third element in its ministry, usually a deacon, a priest, or a bishop is going to be there to perform the baptism. Unless, of course, it is in times of emergency, a lay person can perform a baptism. However, that's a video for another time. So now that we know what makes up baptism, we're actually going to get into what the sacrament of baptism does. So the first thing that baptism does is it basically initiates us into the Catholic Church. Baptism, as mentioned in the beginning, is basically the first sacrament of many that Catholics receive. It's basically the first stepping stone to the other sacraments. The next one would be First Holy Communion, Eucharist, and then Confirmation, and then it goes on from there. When we get baptized, we become adopted children of God. Baptism is also necessary for salvation, and most importantly, it erases original sin caused by Adam and Eve, and God gifts us sanctifying grace. Now that we got that out of the way, I'm going to talk about the three main I don't know, questions I usually get from non-Catholics or even Catholics in general who don't always understand the sacrament of baptism. So we're going to get into it a little bit here. Now obviously one of the most common questions is why do Catholics baptize infants? This may come as a surprise to some, but infant baptism actually isn't a new concept. Early Christians would have their households blessed and households would usually contain infants during that time or children under the age of reason. There's an example of this in Acts 2, 38-39. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And remember, Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Bring me your children. Remember, the women would bring their infants to Jesus, and the apostles were like, nah, 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 he can't be bothered with that. And they were like, and Jesus was like, oh, no, you didn't. Let those children come to me. And how parents do that, they're obligated to have their children come to Jesus through the sacrament of baptism. Another example of this is in Acts 16.33. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, then immediately he and all of his household were baptized. So this is what the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1250, says about infant baptism. Born with a fallen human nature and tainted by original sin, children also have need of the new birth in baptism to be freed from the power of darkness and brought into the realm of the freedom of the children of God, to which all men are called. The sheer gratitudinous of the grace of salvation is particularly manifest in infant baptism. The church and the parents would deny a child the priceless grace of becoming a child of God were they not to confer baptism shortly after birth. I'm going to quote one more person really fast, and his name is Hippolytus. I think that's how you pronounce it, Hippolytus. I'm pretty sure. And... He said this in 215 AD in apostolic tradition. Baptize first the children, and if they can speak for themselves, let them do so. Otherwise, let their parents or others or other relatives speak for them. 
So this basically means if the child is under the age of reason, the parents or the grandparents have an obligation to have that child baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So overall, we baptize infants to bring them closer to God, get rid of original sin, and actually have them become an adopted child of God. Now, this is one that I get a lot. I get this from both Catholics and non-Catholics alike. And I usually give them the same answer, but today we're going to go a little more in depth. And that is, is baptism necessary for salvation? Now the Bible's really clear about what it says about salvation and baptism. And that is, that baptism is necessary for salvation. Let's take a look at what the Bible says. First, I want to bring your attention to Mark 1, 4. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. In 1 Peter 3.21, it says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. See, it says it right out, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus is very clear that baptism is necessary for salvation. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1257, states, The Lord himself affirms that baptism is necessary for salvation. John 3, 5. Jesus answered, Very truly I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless they are born of water and spirit. He also commands his disciples to proclaim the gospel to all nations and to baptize them. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Baptism is necessary for salvation for those to whom the gospel has been proclaimed and who have the possibility of asking for the sacrament. Mark 16:16. 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. The church does not know of any means other than baptism that assures entry into eternal beatitude. This is why she takes care not to neglect the mission she has received from the Lord to see that all who can be baptized are reborn of water and spirit. God has bound salvation to the sacraments of baptism, but he himself is not bound by his sacraments. Now let me tell you what that means. That basically means that if, let's say, somebody's never heard of Jesus Christ in their whole life, or his teaching, or his gospel, through no fault of their own, which means they didn't even have the opportunity to do so, this means that God can work outside of his sacraments to offer that person salvation if he deems that person is worthy. Another good example of this would be an infant who dies before baptism, or um, maybe a child that was aborted, or just a baby who died um, by miscarriage, or something like that. So Jesus and the apostles make it extremely clear that baptism is super important and the sacrament is necessary for salvation. Now, when I usually say this, this is when the third question pops up and they ask me, well, what about the good thief? Now, this person that they talk about is actually Saint Dismas or others pronounce it Dima. Now, it's up to you, but I prefer Dismas because Dismas is just easier for me to pronounce. And we actually celebrate his feast day on March 25th. So let's talk about that. First, we really need to take into account that not all the baptisms were recorded in the Bible. Especially, if you remember, none of the apostles' baptisms were actually mentioned in the Bible. <sighs> this doesn't mean that they weren't baptized. This just means it wasn't documented. But it's obvious that they were, in fact, baptized. So we actually can't say if he was or wasn't baptized. It's not fair to say he wasn't baptized because there's no record showing that he's not and there's no record showing that he is. However, we have a little bit of a hunch here that he might have been. Saint Dismas actually knew that Jesus was God and he seemed to be fairly educated in the topic knowing that Jesus was innocent and sinless and he was basically on that cross for us. So he seemed pretty educated in that topic. Kind of weird, huh? What if Saint Dismas was an apostle? 
but an apostle that fell away from Jesus because his teachings were too hard to grasp or whatever. You know, we see hundreds of people leave Jesus, apostles, followers of him who left him after he spoke on the rock. So could he have been one of those apostles? It would explain how he would know who Jesus is. And if he was one of Jesus' apostles, he would have in fact probably been baptized. Okay, okay, okay. But for argument's sake, let's play the devil's advocate here. Let's say he wasn't baptized. This is where it's important to note the understanding and the timeline of the Bible. When Saint Dismas died, Dismas, you know, whatever. When the good thief died, he died when the old covenant was still in place because he died before Jesus died. When Jesus dies, that's when the new covenant gets put in place. Okay, you guys with me still? Okay, awesome. So technically, he died under the old covenant, which means he wouldn't have actually needed baptism or any of the new found sacraments in the new covenant in order to get into heaven. All in all, we have to admit that nobody has had the same experience as the good thief. Jesus healed and he performed miracles and he forgave many people. But the good thief, he got reconciliation right before he died by Jesus Christ himself. Do you know how special that is? I mean, people were healed and people were, you know, forgiven and everything like that. I see it almost as a foreshadowing as the anointing of the sick, you know, kind of thing. Anyway, I digress. But basically, he literally gets forgiveness from Jesus Christ himself before he's about to die. He doesn't have time to sin again. He's professing his faith right then and there to Jesus Christ that he believes he is the Son of God and that he wants to be in heaven with him and Jesus absolves him of his sins and the good thief dies in good graces with God in the old covenant. Now obviously I'm going to link all of my research below if you guys want to do some more reading and understand where I got all of this from and I hope this will really help you guys kind of piggyback off of it and start doing your own research on things like this and really get a little bit deeper into our faith. I really hope you guys enjoy this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share if you do and I will see you guys next week. God bless!